2022 to order. Uh, I would like to begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I invite everyone to join me, if you can, in standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. City Clerk, could you call the roll, please? Councilmember Holstage. Here. Councilmember Kors. Here. Councilmember Woods. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Gardner. Here. Mayor Middleton. Present. All councils present. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we do not have any presentations uh, this evening. The next uh, item uh, is acceptance of agenda. But before we get into the acceptance of the agenda, I'm going to call on the city manager to report to us why it is that we are uh, going to be unable to have a presentation from uh, the president of the College of the Desert this evening and other individuals uh, from the College of the Desert. Uh, we are city manager, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, I do regret to request that we remove item 5A completely from the agenda to be postponed and hopefully rescheduled for a later date. Uh, the impetus for this meeting goes back to January 24th. As you know, uh, a couple of council member liaisons along with myself have been having bi-monthly meetings with uh, President Superintendent Garcia, as well as two trustees. And at that January 24th meeting, they did offer to come and make a presentation to council. Um, we thought that was a, a, a very appropriate thing to do and a good gesture. We've had cooperative conversations. So we scheduled the meeting at that time. Um, earlier this week on Monday, I did send a courtesy reminder of the meeting and indicated that we would likely get to that item about 6.30 or 7. Uh, the next day, Tuesday the 8th, we did get confirmation. Um, later that day, noticing that we have an unusual circumstance on our agenda this evening, which is a public hearing that needs to be scheduled as close to 7 p.m. as possible. I did note that that could create a circumstance where if some of the agenda went long, we might be a little bit um, after that time, um, but Wednesday, the following day, I was notified by Dr. Garcia that she had a conflict and would need to leave the meeting by 7.15. She did indicate that others of her team members would be able to sit in, in her place, um, but knowing that it's important to the council to have the full team present for, for College of the Desert for that conversation and that the idea was to have a thorough and complete discussion um, we proposed rescheduling. I did reach out early this morning by email to ask uh, about postponing and rescheduling and proposed a number of dates. Um, should note too that we did explore options of rearranging the agenda quite aggressively to get to this item. We know that there were numerous members of the public, um, residents and business stakeholders that had hoped to participate. Um, so we did exhaust those efforts, but we're really unsuccessful. We didn't see a way that we could have a complete conversation um, given the constraints. So this morning asked uh, to postpone. Um, I did follow that up with a call to President Garcia's office and reached one of her staff members early this morning about 10 a.m. Um, and just to make sure they knew the email was coming and there wouldn't be confusion. I did call later about 11.30 in the morning just to stress that we would like to, if possible, get some confirmation um, that they first understood that we weren't able to get to the item and that we would like to reschedule. I was informed at that time that Dr. Garcia has a very busy schedule, which, which I think we all understand. Um, unfortunately, I did not receive a, a reply, at least as of um, right now, uh, confirming that they wouldn't be able to attend or that they would reschedule. But I do trust, um, given that this meeting was their suggestion to begin with, that we will be able to reschedule. I've offered uh, in that same email and communication that we would be as flexible as we can reasonably be. Um, to either put this on one of the next regular agendas or even to schedule a special study session sometime in March that might be more convenient uh, for um, representatives of College of the Desert to make sure that we really can have everyone present and, and have a thorough conversation. Uh, noting that we had um, 30 or potentially more uh, residents that wanted to weigh in, the city clerk has reached those residents and explained that we would likely be deferring this item and asking if they would choose to also defer their public comments 
Um, all but one confirmed that they would like to defer. So we do have one member of the public to speak to that item. And after consulting the city attorney, despite the fact that this is removed from the agenda, we do feel since it was agendized that we can take that at the early section of public comment meant for items on the agenda. So um, with that mayor, if we can remove that item with, with the promise that we will reschedule it, um, that would be appropriate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clifton. And on behalf of uh, the entire city council, uh, we are disappointed uh, that the meeting uh, with uh, Dr. Garcia and uh, Chairman uh, Perez and others will not take place this evening. We remain committed to having an opportunity for city council uh, to meet with Dr. Garcia and uh, uh, Chairman uh, Perez and all, all of the leadership of the College of the Desert. Uh, this is a critical issue for our community, for our region, and we are committed to having uh, an opportunity for everyone in the public to be able to speak and express their uh, concerns, whatever those concerns may be on this subject. And uh, as uh, the city manager noted, we had nearly 30 individuals who were prepared to give public comment uh, this evening on this subject. Uh, we believe that uh, this item has been deferred uh, and we look forward to the opportunity to reschedule it at the earliest possible time uh, at a time that is convenient to everyone at the College of the Desert and affords the public an opportunity uh, to be heard and for us as a city council uh, to be able to consult with our colleagues at the College of the Desert and with their president. Thank you. With that, our next item is acceptance of the agenda. The City Council will discuss the order of the agenda and may amend the order, add urgency items, note abstentions or no votes on consent calendar items or request consent calendar items to be removed for separate discussion. I would like to entertain a motion for acceptance of the agenda. Are there any items staff or council member would like to have removed from the consent calendar, notwithstanding obviously item 5A. <clears throat> We're gonna set a record and not have anything removed from consent. All right. Is there a motion to accept the consent calendar? So moved. Seconded. All right, uh, roll call please. Mayor Pro Tim Gardner. Yes. Council Member Holstech. Yes. Council Member Kors. Yes. Mayor Pro Tim Gardner. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I may have lost my order. Council Member Woods. Yes. And Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is a report of closed session. Mr. Ballinger. Yes, Honorable Mayor and members of the Council, members of the public, the City Council met in closed session earlier this afternoon to discuss the items that are listed on the agenda, and there was no reportable action. Right. And our next item will be to move to uh, public testimony on non-public hearing agenda items only. Uh, next. This is time has been set aside for members of the public to address the city council on non-public hearing agenda items only. Two minutes will be assigned to each speaker. You are asked to please begin your time by telling us what agenda item or items you are speaking about. Please note the testimony for public hearings will be that will be taken at the time of the public hearing and general public comments on subjects that are not on the agenda will be taken later in the evening, approximately 9 p.m. Tonight, the city clerk will be contacting speakers via telephone. Mr. Mejia, can you take it away? Bruce Hoban, you're live at the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. My name is Bruce Holman. I live in Palm Springs, and I wish to uh, comment on the item that has been pulled from the agenda. My message to the council is, please hold uh, College of the Desert trustee members Gonzalez, Wilson, and Pro 
res accountable for hiring somebody for $350,000 a year plus generous benefits who for the third time in a row has set up meetings to do outreach to either the community or the city councils and then bailed with a scheduling conflict. This is unacceptable and the board of trustees should be held accountable and ask for a correction in this type of behavior. Thank you and everyone have a good evening. Thank you. Madam Mayor, that does conclude public comment. Mr. Mejia, thank you. The next item is City Council Subcommittee, City Manager comments and reports. Uh, do any of my colleagues have uh, comments or presentations at this time? Well, I don't see any. I have one. Uh, Riverside County Transportation Commission met uh, this week, and uh, while it's going to take a bit of time, one bit of good news for anyone who has uh, uh, gotten on to Interstate 10 uh, with a traffic accident somewhere in the San Gorgonio Pass area, uh, we approved uh, the first design work for what will be a uh, I-10 bypass that will run from Cabazon over to uh, Beaumont that will be available for use so that uh, when there are uh, lane closures and uh, unavoidable accidents on I-10, uh, that there will be an alternative route through the, uh, the uh, San Gorgonio Pass area. Uh, I'm really pleased personally to hear uh, that is there. I had one of those occasions as I was trying to get to Ontario International Airport and freeway was simply uh, completely closed down. Uh, this is a project that's been a long time in the works. Uh, the sad part of this is, well, we approved the initial design work this week. Uh, the date uh, that the first car is expected to uh, roll down that uh, bypass is approximately mid 2028, uh, but we, we've gotten started. These infrastructure projects are so important to our region and to our community. So are there any other uh, comments? Uh, Council Member Woods. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, um, <clears throat> you know, when we had the FBI raid City Hall, several of the then standing council members uh, stood up and they were shocked at the time that that raid had occurred. And they um, supposedly didn't see any of the signs of any sort of uh, malfeasance going on. And from that process, um, the city developed uh, a series of protections in place to basically make sure that we were more transparent, that um, what we had, um, uh, we had mechanisms in place. Um, I'm a little concerned um, and I want to bring up um, um, a recommendation to have an independent investigation of the Measure J Commission. And I can tell you why I'm thinking of that. Um, the Measure J Commission is an oversight commission by our city code and it has morphed into something much different than an oversight commission. And at some point in history, which we're researching now, it was given the opportunity to either recommend or actually spend a million dollars worth of Measure J funding. Um, that to me seems to be a huge conflict because how can you oversee and be an oversight commission at the same time that you're awarding money for projects? If somebody like uh, COD were to do that, I think that our attorneys would likely be um, all over it. So I am very concerned, but, um, and I want the investigation. I think it even goes on further. The chair of the commission has made an assumption that they have $3 million to distribute, yet there's no record that I can find from the council actually approving that. He assumes that, that it's cumulative and has so stated to the public uh, and to his commissioners. 
The commission is directing the city staff or themselves to write letters to people who have, have applied for community projects, but by code, this needs to go through the city manager's office. Even more so is there could be a potential conflict, um, I think with a few of the commissioners where they sit on boards and whatnot. I'll give you one example. Um, the Measure J chair happens to sit on both the PISHA and the Visit Palm Springs board. PISHA is a mutual benefit organization, which means that it works solely for its members and not for the greater good of the city. It's for its members. Also the JPA that sets up uh, uh, Visit Greater Palm Springs is also just for its membership and hospitality. The reason I mention this is there are criteria in the rating package for the community projects. And in that rating package, like I think it's three of them are about, about the tourist industry. Um, this person sits on the board of two tourist um, organizations. It is very unclear at this point who wrote up those grading criteria and why anything with measure J should be graded on um, hospitality. Um, so uh, it needs to be explored. They're also asked, the commission's also asking um, people who've applied, which there've been many great projects to pitch their project as if they were on the Donald Trump show or something. Yet they've eliminated some of the proposals before they even gave an opportunity for the public to pitch something. I'm not sure where this idea that they can pitch comes from, but it certainly begs the question of why are they doing this? Why is it being subjective? Why aren't there better rating systems? You know, this is a commission that is not elected by the public. Um, and if they're giving out money, I believe that can lead to favoritism. It can lead to open corruption. And I don't think it's a good model that we want to set. It's not a transparent model. And as a matter of fact, the rating sheets that each of the commissioners use based on this criteria I mentioned earlier were not available to the public or to me. And the, ra the overall rating sheet, which was completely, you know, a rating all of them, was held by the chair and never distributed in the meeting, yet the entire meeting was about that discussion. That is not transparent. That is not what we want as a city. That's not the protections that we put in. You know, um, the commission, the chair has also asked that this commission meet with other commissioners and, and not other commissioners, but other commissions and have joint meetings. That's not what the code allows. They can meet with the city council. Other commissions have put Measure J stuff on their agendas. And people have mentioned they don't want to offend the chair or others, in fact, that they might not get their project approved. This puts way too much power in the hands of a non-elected official, and it's not really the right thing that we should be doing. You know, they took a stance on the downtown park not to approve the downtown park once they had actually funded and approved it. I don't know where that came from. I don't know what was the impetus of that. But again, when I read the code, it doesn't seem to be in their line of duty. Um, you know, lastly, I guess I'll say is there, um, the, the chair has expressed that he wants this commission to have a lot more power. He wants to make a five-year plan and all of that. And um, I don't think we've ever given that authority. So having this in the public realm, you know, and having this actually on our website and on our YouTube site, I don't think is healthy for the city. So I'm actually going to ask for an independent investigation as to what's going on so that we can correct it immediately before we get any further down the line with evaluating these um, opportunities for Measure J. Um, and I'm going to ask because of his, because of the chair's political ties with several of the council members and his close friendship, and the fact that he's giving donations, that the council not be involved, that it be independent. Um, I just, um, you know, having watched what happened in previous administrations before I was on board, I certainly don't want to repeat this. I'm not saying it is a massive issue, but if they think they can spend a three million dollars and not have a system that seems fair and honest to every single person that applied for that, that's not what we want. So I'm just asking for an investigation. I'm not making any accusations at this point. I just want to understand what is going on and how we're going to approach it.
So thank you, Madam Chair, Ma Madam Mayor. Uh, Council Member Kors. Right. Um, we can't deliberate, but I find using our time on this council to attack a political opponent because someone's the measure Che chair is running against you to be incredibly offensive and outrageous. If you think there was some illegal activity, you bring it up to the city attorney in closed session. Um, your, all your allegations are totally false. And city council voted, if you paid attention to city council meetings, um, when the Measure J Oversight Commission was adopted, it was by the voters, not the city council. And the first thing they did was they took applications, I think over a hundred for how Measure J should be spent. Then they came to city council and say, you know, just we'll make recommendations. They don't direct the money. They make recommendations to us. You've been on council, this is your third year. You should know they make recommendations to us. They make recommendations to us and we decide. Some years we've supported their community projects, some year we don't. If there's a conflict, um, then someone would have to waive. But I don't believe any of the organizations, the boards that Mr. Bernstein sits on have applied for funding. The fact that their tourism boards is no different than people applying to funding who sit on you know, Parks and Rec or, or boards that are advancing pickleball. Um, but to use the dais for a candidate attack, and because someone's friends with someone, you want an independent investigation. You know, a lot of your friends gave you campaign donations, Dennis. I think that was one of the most outrageous things I've seen on this dais, and I've seen a lot. It is totally offensive. Um, I disagree. You're um, welcome I, to, but I, I, you made your public comments. I'm making mine. Right. Hold on. Excuse me. Uh, I'd like to consult with the city attorney. Uh, Mr. Ballinger, we have had a request and we have also had a discussion that uh, does not appear to be a normal part of uh, council member presentations. Can you give us advice as to how we should proceed at this point? Yes, um, I would recommend that the council limit its discussion to whether you want to agendize this at a future meeting um, and not get into the substance uh, too much of of the, uh, of the request from uh, Council Member Woods. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, I'd recommend moving on to the next Council Member for comments. All right. So uh, is there a, we have a request from uh, a member of City Council to agendize this for future discussion. Is there a second for that? Then I will do it as a whistleblower. Um, I will do it as a whistleblower um, um, complaint. Uh, we can consult uh, uh, in closed session and consult with the city attorney and city manager as to what's the appropriate uh, direction to use moving forward. Uh, but at this time, I'm going to move on to any other uh, council member uh, comments. Are there any? Uh, council member Coors. Just one, and to end on a positive note. So last week was the first um, of the Chamber of Commerce produced <laughs> concerts in the park. Um, Mayor Middleton, Council Member Woods and I were there. Um, I don't know about uh, our other two council members since it was packed. I mean, it was, I think, 58 degrees and cold and windy and you couldn't, there was no more room for people. So what a great start to, of the programming of our downtown park. And I want to just let know, people know every Wednesday um, until through July, the first Wednesday of the month will be a concert. And uh, lots of people went out to dinner early and um, it's just really fun. It was a great concert. It was an uh, Eagles cover band. The next one's Madonna. Um, and these will keep going. So uh, kudos to the chamber and thanks to the city and PS Resorts and the Hospitality Association, our small hotel group for sponsoring this along with the chamber. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay, uh, thank you. So, uh, Mr. Mejia, we have already voted on consent calendar. Do we need to return to uh, that or now? Yes, uh, we approved the order, order of the agenda. We'll need to approve the consent calendar now. Okay, then uh, is there a motion to approve consent calendar? So moved. Second. We get moved in second. Roll call, please. Council Member Holstich. 
Yes. And if I could can I add a discussion point, Mayor Middleton, if I may, I just want to give a shout out to city staff for applying for and receiving um, a million over a million dollars in the cannabis social equity grant. I just think our city is really leading the way for the state um, on this equity program in cannabis, cannabis and to support these business owners. Um, it's really cool to see your work. So I just wanted to thank city staff um, as well as the social equity applicants. Um, for all of their work on this. And with that, I vote yes. Council Member Kors. For the same reasons, yes. <laughs> Council Member Woods. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Gardner. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. All right. So we have uh, next on the agenda are uh, public hearings. As I understand it, uh, uh, item 2A is one that we need to act on at approximately 7 p.m. Is that correct, Mr. Mejia? Correct. Item 2A uh, needs to occur 7 p.m. or after. Okay. Uh, and item 2B, uh, we have at least one uh, affected member of the public who uh, is expecting that item to come up after 2A or sometime closer to 7.30. So uh, there is, as I understand it, no restrictions on the time in which we approach item 2C. Can we go ahead and uh, move to item 2C? And with that, I will ask for a staff report. Uh Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, Joel Montalvo, City Engineer. The item before you today is a, for a right-of-way vacation a portion of public right-of-way on Grand Via Belmonte, located between Indian Canyon and Via Chica. Grand Via Belmonte was originally dedicated with a 60-foot public right-of-way in about 1927. The street is currently designated as a local street and with a required 50-foot uh, right-of-way. With um, in certain areas of Granville Monte, however, the right-of-way has been reduced by 20 feet, slightly below the requirement for a local street. The applicant is requesting that the right-of-way in front of his home be reduced by 20 feet as well. The Planning Commission at its uh, January 12th meeting found that the right-of-way vacation was in conformance with the general plan and meant that intended design uh, envisioned in the general plan circulation policies. Staff has done all the research and communicated with all the utility companies and has determined that the excess right-of-way can be vacated. Uh, however, Southern California has requested that the an easement be uh, set aside for their gas main and we can't accommodate that. So that concludes my report and staff recommends a vacation of the right-of-way. Are there any questions for staff? Uh, seeing no questions. Uh, at this time, I would like to open the public hearing. The public is invited to speak on this public hearing uh, item for up to two minutes. Mr. Mejia, do we have any uh, public comments? Madam Mayor, there's no public comment for this item. All right. There being no speakers, the public hearing is now closed. Is there any discussion or additional questions from council? I see none. Uh, I'll move the item. We have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, roll call, please. Council Member Kors. Yes. Council Member Holstich. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Gardner. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. All right. We will now move on to item 4A, which is. A review of emergency orders related to COVID-19. I would like to ask for a staff report, please. Uh, good evening, <clears throat> Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, let me give me one moment to catch up. I didn't know we were gonna be uh, so far ahead of schedule. Um, pulling up the PowerPoint right now. Uh, we, we're moving along pretty quickly. <laughs> Do you have it? Yes, we are. So uh, good evening, Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, so tonight, obviously, we're going to go through an update of where we are with COVID right now. 
help reframe the discussion on our local orders. But before we do that, I do feel it's prudent to remind council that we had a massive backlog of cases that hit us uh, in between Monday and Tuesday. It was 110,654 cases that uh, magically showed up on Tuesday morning. Uh, so if we added that data to our normal graphics, it would skew things and, and would it would present an inaccurate picture of the true nature of, of things as they are right now. So I do have the cumulative data. I have been working very closely with uh, public health and their chief epidemiologist. Uh, so we do have the cumulative data, but not the granularity that I normally show you uh, here at the city level. Uh, the preponderance of that 110,000, uh, about 90,000 of those was from the two, first two weeks of January and 10,000 from uh, Christmas time and about 10,000 from mid-January uh, to now. So that picture right there paints that uh, early January was our, our high point. Uh, and as we're looking at the six metrics that the state tracks, again, this has been updated with the backlog and we see the Omicron surge uh, really did spike a lot higher than uh, last winter's surge. And that aligns with everything that we've been seeing in our wastewater uh, treatment numbers. Uh, I'll talk more about that later. Uh, so we had a peak in mid-January and then uh, a pretty rapid decrease. Uh, we're still not not as good as we could be, but but we have seen significant improvement over the past couple of weeks as we've been talking about. Uh, so instead of the normal Riverside County graphic that I show you, I, I pulled the epi epidemiological report uh, because they've actually gone back and, and corrected all the backlog data uh, by week. We're still working on getting that at the zip code and city level. Uh, it, it is a work in progress. But what this shows you is uh, we had a major peak in mid-January and a, a gradual downward trend. And we see that the, the peak for Omicron in mid-January was uh, significantly higher than the peak that we saw uh, last uh, winter season. So right now, the the county is averaging about 2,000 cases per day, which reflects uh, what we were talking about the previous couple of weeks of about 13,000 cases per week uh, for the past two weeks. Uh, and again, I, I apologize, the backlog uh, throws off all of our graphics. Uh, as I noted, you know, uh, the, the backlog really throws uh, the graphic off. So instead of trying to add uh, 1,300 cases to this week. Uh, I just put a, a block underneath that shows what we were tracking on Monday was uh, close to 6,000 cases. Uh, but in reality, our total case count uh, for Palm Springs is just over 7,000. And again, I, I'm working with the county to, to clear up uh, and, and really paint a better picture of where we sit. Um, so the Coachella Valley, again, I, I, I went through and put a, a sub block under there so we can see really what that backlog means. Um, it, it's going to take some time to, to get that granularity, Madam Mayor. I apologize for that. But uh, you see, Danny? yes. Danny, uh, if you have a PowerPoint presentation with graphs, I, I don't know that it's coming through. Oh, uh, let me see. Thank you. I apologize. I don't know how to me find. It says that I am sharing my screen. Are you using two Would monitors you? by chance? I am. Through the technical issues. So. I am. So you, we have. I don't know. You may try to drag it over. How about now? There we go. There we go. Okay. I apologize. And now, now we can all see what I'm talking about. Uh, Madam Mayor, would you like me to go back a couple of slides? I, so we can see? I think probably going back a couple of slides would be good. We, uh, we, we Most of us have seen some of this data, but the public has not. Uh, and uh, uh, let's, let's start at the beginning again. Uh, these subjects uh, are so important. Uh, okay, Madam Mayor. So to, to not uh, reiterate all the words that I've said, I'll just highlight 
Uh, as you can see, the state and the county have rectified the backlog at their level, uh, but it's going to take time to, to put all of those cases in the right place for, for zip code to, for us to track at the, at the city level. But here with the state metrics, we see that we have that peak uh, in mid-January and then a sharp decline, which that's really looking very similar to the way that it looked uh, last year as we exited the winter and entered, it, entered into spring 2021. So here's the, the graphic that I uh, stole from uh, Riverside County Public Health, their epidemiolo epidemiology department uh, puts this together uh, and we'll work on getting this fixed for our graphics uh, moving forward. So they have gone from 450,000 to 575,000 total cases here in the county. Again, that 110,000 over the past uh, six to eight weeks uh, peaked in mid-January and has uh, slowly trended downward uh, the, the city slide. Um, again, the, the sub box that shows what we were tracking on Monday and what we're tracking today. Uh, and we'll fix, uh, we'll fix these graphics moving forward. Um, I really wanna thank uh, public health for letting me work with their epi epidemiology chief uh, to get that granularity that we like to track. Uh, here's the Coachella Valley. Uh, as I was saying, Palm Springs, uh, we had 1,300 additional cases added to our total on Monday, uh, but no deaths. Uh, so we're still at 145 of our friends and neighbors that have lost their life to COVID. Um, we did have some uh, cities that did have a change in their deaths. And again, the, the, the deaths can fluctuate over uh, about a three week period. Um, so Palm Springs had 1300 additional cases, uh, which is uh, significant. Uh, Riverside the city had over 16,000 cases from the backlog. Uh, Indio had about 3,800 cases from the backlog, uh, but all of the numbers that, that we're seeing are showing the same general turn where we had the peak in mid-January where that 90,000 uh, cases was at and, and we're trending downward. So our wastewater treatment data, This uh, the good thing about our wastewater data is uh, while we can get a delay on our own tests, we're not going to have the backlog. So this is the same picture that we've been looking at uh, for the past year. Uh, same thing, mid-January, we had a peak uh, and we're rapidly coming down. And on the next slide or the next two slides, we'll see uh, where we actually sit in comparison to uh, last year. So the peak of almost 7 million uh, uh, count viral load, which is significantly higher than last year. And now we're down to about mid 700,000 range, which is where we were about this time last year. Uh, and as this, this slide shows. So, and that's about the time when we started seeing a drastic plummet in, in the case counts, uh, which is, uh, it's hopeful, uh, but we do have ways to go. And, and our GT molecular slide that shows their estimated case counts, uh, you know, it peaked on for them January 11th with about 38,000 cases estimated, and now we're around 1,600. And that includes residents, visitors, and anybody that comes to uh, uh, get rid of water uh, in Palm Springs. Uh, before we move on, I do have two more slides that I'd like to go over. One of them is uh, our current local ordinances. Uh, well, three are local ordinances, and one applies to city staff uh, that we still have locally. Uh, mass required for all people, regardless of the vaccination status, uh, indoors and in large gatherings, uh, proof of vaccination status or negative test at bars and restaurants, and proof of vaccination status or negative COVID test for large events. And the last one is just weekly testing for unvaccinated city staff. Uh, we have begun testing, uh, but the next slide is what some other locations are doing, what we're seeing. Uh, really globally, uh, and not just here locally, we, we've all read the news that California is going to loosen some of their mass restrictions. Large events are no longer going to be considered large at 500. It's going to be 1,000. 
and the state is no longer considering uh, the idea of requiring proof of vaccination in retail settings or in bars and restaurants. Several states across the country are loosening their mask restrictions in various ways. Uh, New York, uh, they've, they've said that their mask mandate will not be renewed, uh, and that was effective as of today. And they're considering uh, not requiring masks in school settings. I put on here, Australia is opening their border for the first time since COVID began. Uh, that was written on Monday. And since then, several other countries have come out and they're following suit. I know I heard about Israel today. Uh, not everybody is uh, loosening their restrictions. Some places are keeping uh, more conservative approaches. Uh, San Francisco is keeping most of their, uh, their protocols in place with a few minor tweaks. Uh, so they're adjusting their mask and vaccination requirement uh, in like gyms, uh, if it's a normal group of people that are all vaccinated or have shown uh, a negative test, then they can not be masked inside of a gym. Uh, there's a lot of intricacies to what San Francisco is doing, but they're mostly keeping their stuff pretty uh, restrictive. Uh, the same with Los Angeles. Uh, they're requiring vaccination in most indoor settings, well, uh, vaccination or negative test, and they're going to keep uh, indoor masks. Uh, for the time being. Uh, one interesting note that I did find was New York City is going to continue with outdoor dining. So like our parklets, uh, both as a public health measure and obviously a, a fiscal measure. Uh, but that concludes my brief. And if there's any questions? All right. Are there questions for Mr. DeSalms? And could we take the slide down so that I can see everyone? Yes, uh, council member course. Yeah, on the question front. Um, so I see San Francisco and Los Angeles not doing it. The state, the state, as I understood it said, and I know we their numbers are all messy, but they had a 67% drop in new cases, right? So how do we compare in new cases where we're seeing, that's the one metrics that seems to be going up. Um, here, how do we compare to compare to the state, San Francisco, LA? So the two places that are keeping it, and then the state, of course, which is bigger, and you know people do things regionally. It's not required. Uh, Councilmember, that's actually that's kind of a tough question given the the thirteen hundred cases that we just got between Monday and Tuesday. I do know after having multiple conversations with uh, public health and their chief epidemiologist that the bulk of those cases were from uh, the first two weeks of January. And some of the higher numbers that we've been seeing is a, a trickle effect of, of that backlog. So our, our, our numbers are decreasing, but they're artificially high. Uh, but the general consensus is uh, we were worse mid-January and we are doing better now than we were then. As far as hard numbers, I, I can't give you that at this time. So, if our numbers are higher than mid-January and we haven't, but we haven't added those cases, right? Our numbers without those cases show it's higher, right? Uh, if, I just want to understand. Yeah. And so, if we if we remove the thirteen hundred cases that were added, uh, our numbers were looking. So we had uh, a couple of weeks where we were decreasing from about mid-January, uh, and then this week and last week we had an increase. However, what I've been told is that increase is artificial because that was the beginning of the backlog coming through. Got it. So, so, so the numbers Monday had some of the backlog, but not the big dump backlog. Correct. It was, right. we, we've been playing catch up for the past couple of weeks, yes. Okay, sure makes it hard to <laughs> know what's going on. Um, so just a little, um, just to share with council. So, uh, uh, Council Member Holstage and I were on uh, the GM breakfast yesterday. I think we asked for input on this. Um, five or six of the businesses spoke. Everyone on it wanted us to keep our current rules. Um, there was, um, and there are obviously retail, restaurant, hotels. Um, but when we threw out the various ideas that are in the staff report, like the idea of having some criteria, like when we meet the decrease in cases the state met or something like that. Uh, Mayor and I were on the Hospitality Association. We also asked for input with the various options in the staff report. And we heard from 
a hotel uh, with a local restaurant and retail. Uh, one suggested uh, we uh, authorize the city manager to make the decision ba based on seeing how the matrix go in the next week or two. Another suggested we follow Los Angeles since that's where most of our guests are from and that's what they expect. So I just wanted to share that so council had that input. This wasn't a survey, it was, you know, uh, but no one had, no one suggested um, lifting the rules on the 15th. Uh, and then a number of, uh, I've heard from a number of small businesses and a restaurant in my district who, one who is very adamant against the rules, who's asked that we at least keep them through modernism week. And um, some are really worried about losing employees and some restaurants had to close recently uh, due to employees with COVID. And, um, that the workers were unanimous in wanting to keep the rules. So uh, again, we haven't done a survey and um, so it's just the limited information I had uh, from those meetings. So I wanted to share that. Uh, yes, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that um, Council Member Kors. And then we also received an email just right as our meeting was starting um, from Main Street with some information there and it looked like there was a lot of people who didn't want them in place anymore. Um, you know, I've been hearing from small businesses that are not downtown that are concerned um, about the vaccination. And I've been hearing from the people that um, I've been hearing from have been uh, wanting us to remove everything. Um, but I think the vaccination requirements when you're entering restaurant restaurants has been the most um, difficult for them. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. The other thing, um, when we did have the county come in, they mentioned that the restaurant, the requirement for vaccinations to enter a restaurant wasn't really necessarily going to be a huge game changer for us. And I think we've seen that in our numbers across the valley. We're not seeing that Palm Springs is um, protected in any different way than the other. So for instance, you know, Indio has more cases, but when you see the declines or you see the increases, the percentage wise, it's about the same as what Palm Springs is dealing with and what all the other, the other Coachella Valley cities are doing, right? So we all have a, currently a mask mandate, but we don't all have the vaccination requirement for restaurants. So it's looking like masks are working, but I'm, I'm my concern is, is the vaccination requirement at restaurants actually achieving the goals that we've set out to achieve. Are there other questions, discussion? Uh, Council Member Woods and then Council Member Halstead. Uh, just two questions. One is um, uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner referred to the Main Street um, survey. I don't know if staff has had a chance to digest it. It just came in, but I think 57% or something said um, that they didn't want some of the mass mandates, but maybe they can digest that and, and let us know. But um, for staff, I'm just wondering what, um, you know, I've listened, I've read several things before coming here about what are the benefits of a mask versus not mask? Because there seems to be, it seems to be all over the board. I'm not sure who that question is directed to, Council Member Woods. Um, I think uh, our emergency man management uh, coordinator can weigh in, but I do think that things are getting a little more confusing as we progress in this pandemic. You know, um, masks, I think, are certainly still effective, but Omicron proved to be so contagious. And that's one of the reasons that some of the CD guidelines started to recommend um, high quality masks and 95 KN95, et cetera, because those provide an extra measure of protection um, against a viral load that was frankly more uh, prolific than previous variants. So I haven't really kept up on some of the most recent literature and I don't know that there have been additional anecdotal or other studies performed because Omicron has been a fairly quick moving variant. So I don't know that we've had the benefit of exhaustive study. I do know that health departments are still recommending masks as guidelines, the CDC certainly is, um, but to what extent they are equally effective, I, I think there's a legitimate question there. Um, same thing with vaccinations, where for a time it was really thought to suppress the spread and the transmission of the virus, but at least anecdotally, locally, um, within our own organization, when we started to look at the correlation, 
We found that substantial numbers, I think close to 50% of those who ultimately contracted COVID uh, were vaccinated. So things have certainly shifted, but again, the, the prevailing um, public health recommendations are still that those are measures of protection that are encouraged um, and, and the guidelines reflect that. Is that all your questions, uh, Council Member Woods? Okay, uh, Council Member Halstitch. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I uh, really appreciate all the information in the staff report and um, staff for leading us through this pandemic as we uh, it continues to evolve. Um, and it's, it's difficult for us to make these decisions, uh, especially where the numbers are now. So I appreciate that we've been focused on a science-based and data-based uh, strategy here to keep our residents safe. And if I can just say, I do think actually our... Um, requirements or our rules that we have implemented. If you compare Palm Springs to Palm Desert or La Quinta or other comparable cities, um, our numbers overall are much, much lower, even when you compare to cities that might have a comparable number to workers. But I appreciate Mayor Pro Tem Garner's points about the surges. The surges are difficult to stop. They're happening everywhere. Um, but I do, I'm not a social scientist, but I think that our, our, um, rules in place to protect people are working. Sorry, I'm having a hard time emotionally recovering from what happened earlier in council member comments. So just to say that out loud, um, I'm a little flustered. So um, my request, I want to see where council is, is um, delegating to the city manager to remove the restrictions when the data demands it, when we see a reduction in cases, which we expect to happen, hopefully in the next two weeks here or so, um, but really give some metrics to the city manager. Um, you know, we want to do that work talking to all businesses, especially the very small ones, which are having a hard time. Um, we are also hearing from residents who are saying, um, you know, the impacts on gyms, for example, and, you know, the unfair competition between other places. Um, so I do think we want to get to a place where we um, eliminate these requirements. That's what our commitment was to the businesses um, when we initially did this. It's gone on a lot longer than we thought we would have to because of the surge. Um, and I've been speaking to workers um, as I go through the city, um, and most workers just anecdotally that I've talked to have asked um, for us to retain the rules, at least while they're needed. Um, to stay safe in their workplaces indoors. So unfortunately, we don't have a um, super organized um, place like we can for businesses where we go and ask workers. Um, but that's the what input that I've received. Um, so I am open to hearing what the council wants to do, but um, I would request that we consider um, delegating authority to the city manager um, and staff to uh, remove the rules when the data um, demands it or, you know, when um, caseloads have um, gone down for two weeks consecutively or some metric like that that staff can define. Uh, Council Member Coors. Um, yeah, I, I think that makes sense. I think, you know, um, in consultation, right, with our emergency manager and talking to the public health agencies, um, you know, I good with giving, delegating that to the uh, City manager, I'm just looking at the Main Street thing um, since we got that just as the meeting started. Um, and it was 51% to 44% to keep the mask requirement, but the 57% um, did not want to keep the proof of vaccination or negative test in a restaurant. Um, so it's split. But again, I think the point you made, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, is this is one court, this is like the downtown core. Um, and we don't know if that's sort of the thought everywhere, uh, but um, I think if delegating that to the city manager, one, you know, once the metrics uh, start to go in the right direction, um, and that could be a week next week, right? Once we, now that that data dumps in as it gets um, thrown out, I think makes sense. Uh, I think we all want these to be over like months ago. Um, and, uh, you know, it'd be really nice in two weeks to be meeting in person. So, but I'd like to, um, you know, have the city manager do that. And if, uh, you know, at his discretion, could send out a broader survey 
you know, one to residents and one to businesses, if we have that ability to get some broader, if you want the broader impact to make an informed decision. So if that was a motion, I'll second it. Uh, I had a couple of questions uh, before we move to uh, to the motions, but uh, uh, Danny, uh, the County of Riverside, are they imposing any restrictions unique or different from the uh, uh, state of California? Uh, Madam Mayor, to my knowledge, the, the county is not uh, going to implement any guidelines or rules or COVID protocols other than those that are implemented by the state uh, just for ease of, of everybody's knowledge of what to do and what not to do. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Clifton, as I follow the, the lead that I think my colleagues are heading towards, uh, we would be delegating to you authority to make a determination as to when to remove the Palm Springs specific uh, restrictions. And it sounds like it would be something along the lines of when we are uh, by data driven information, uh, reasonably consistent with where the state of California is in terms of uh, uh, exposures. Uh, does that give you the kind of direction you would need and what kinds of metrics would you be relying on? Thank you very much, Mayor. I, I am comfortable with that kind of delegation. What I would ask, though, is that Council have any more conversation it may want to regarding those metrics and the criteria. Um, I heard reference to a couple consecutive weeks of declining numbers. Um, we can also extrapolate a rate per 100,000 um, and, and look at kind of where the state is now and apply that kind of a measure to Palm Springs. Um, but if there are other suggestions about what you feel are the appropriate measures, then I think we could just be a little more comprehensive in that effort and make sure that we've hit, say, a, a median range of those measures um, or, or you know, two out of three of them or something like that. I think we would probably also conduct one additional outreach survey to let residents and uh, business community weigh in. Um, but if there are other thoughts on the appropriate criteria, it would help to hear those so that as we establish those and apply them, um, we're most likely to reflect the will of council. Okay. If uh, I could, uh, you know, I think the burden of proof is on us as a city. If we're going to impose an additional requirement to have a justification for it. Uh, and it seems to me that justification would be, we have uh, a populace of residents and visitors that are at uh, increased risk uh, from uh, that which uh, the state of California is defining. And so uh, I'd be looking for you to, uh, to be able to identify that there's something in Palm Springs that is uh, different uh, than the uh, state as a whole and places us at greater risk and therefore justifies uh, the additional uh, controls. Uh, I also think it would be appropriate to give people reasonable notice uh, as to when we're going to uh, make change uh, and taking and doing so uh, uh, with only a day or some days notice, uh, I don't think is quite uh, fair and adequate. What one of the things that we're seeing from the informal polling that's gone on uh, and certainly is reflective of the emails and phone calls I've received, the city is incredibly divided on this issue. Uh, between individuals who are anxious to uh, remove all controls immediately uh, and those who are extremely nervous. Uh, I don't think that division is gonna go away and we need to be respectful of both. Uh, Mayor Pro Temp Garner. Thank you. Um, in terms of metrics and things like that, I think a big thing for me is just working with the county health department, right, to find out what it is that they're recommending and, and what the best practices are, um, which is why I reference back to the conversation that we had with the county health about the vaccination requirement. I think that kind of information on what it, whether or not our restrictions are effective is really an important part of it. Because obviously if it's effective, I want everyone to be safe. If it's not effective, then why are we doing it? So that that's really what I would like to know is just if, what are the numbers saying? 
um, in light of what what we're doing, um, and and base it on on that with with conversations with these health experts. Anyone else want to make comments before we, uh, Councilmember Woods? Uh, you know, I'm not a health expert, and that's why I asked the question earlier. And I'd hate to um, either impose um, something onto somebody that that's not effective, or remove something that could put them in danger. So um, I'm uh, with my colleagues, and I would like it to be science based on whatever decision we make um, on this, um, because I think um, the mayor's correct. We have people on both sides of this issue. Uh, and I don't have enough information to really, or, or the, I'm not a public health official to know really what the best course is for us. Uh, Council Member Coors. Yeah, just two um, related notes. Um, when we do, uh, just from a number of businesses I heard from, when we do uh, change whatever our rules are, even if it's to conform to the state that we get some new signs, um, you know, for, for businesses, they just ask that we, um, keep that on the list. And I heard from several that were really concerned that they read the state's rule that says you can be unmasked inside a business only if you're vaccinated to mean that they're gonna to have to check vaccines of people going to businesses. And while I, the state rule makes no sense to me because there's no way, right? Small retail is gonna be able to, you know, you don't check in, you don't do anything like that. Um, if we heard anything from the state that they expect anyone to actually check in a business or just that's what they're recommending people do? Because businesses have asked me that. Uh, Danny. Uh, thank you, Council Member, for the question. So really what we're hearing from the state is it, it's going to be based on integrity. If you say that you're vaccinated, the business is supposed to assume that you are. Uh, they understand the challenge of trying to enforce uh, verification of vaccination status. So it's, uh, it's going to be a matter of trust. Yeah. Okay. Just because we may get that question and maybe we can include it in when we do our next business update, something on that, because I did get that from several of our businesses. You know, I think that's something that's going to have to get uh, really well publicized because we're going to have uh, an incredible number of people who are very nervous about being uh, in places with uh, individuals who are unmasked. Uh, and uh, uh, say that they're vaccinated uh, when they're not. Uh, and if that's the rule, that's the rule, but uh, uh, we all need to understand that's what the rule is. Uh, are we at the point we can get a motion? And I think we are. Uh, did Council Member uh, Coors or Holstage want to offer a motion? Because I think you guys are ready to do so. I don't know. Anthony, do you have what uh, Council Member Holstage said? And not I have that we are going to delegate to the city manager the authority to remove the restrictions when uh, metrics warrant it. Um, and that does look like two consecutive weeks of decline. And uh, possibly an additional outreach survey, and then uh, any other metrics that the city manager may develop to determine whether to remove the restrictions. Is that fine with council or are there any amendments? Just a, a clarification, when we say two weeks of decline, is that our sewage treatment plant or is that state um, reporting or what does that mean? Um, yeah, I was going to suggest, I, th I think it was new cases, um, a decline in new cases, but I think we don't want to, I don't think we want to give the city manager the specifics. I think it's just the first part of the motion, right, using like scientific data to make the decision. So if we see next week it drops in half because it was just this, ex the state dumping everything in, then maybe that's the right time. So my preference, if it's okay with the, the motion maker, is that it's just the first part of the motion that we let sort of the city manager, you know, talk to the public health officials, look at the matrix and make a database decision. I would like to offer a necessary one amendment that uh, the city manager be able to phase in these uh, removal as uh, he sees appropriate. So if as example, uh, he felt that it was appropriate to uh, reopen City Hall in advance of uh, 
uh, removing a restriction related to masks or something else that he would be able to do so. Thank you. So I'll make that motion. I'll second. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Holstich. Yes. Councilmember Kors. Yes. Councilmember Woods. Yes. yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mejia, if you'll help me, uh, the uh, public the hearing item two uh, B or two A and two B seem to be the only remaining. Uh, items on our agenda. We also have public comment uh, for non-public or non-agenda items. Do we have any public comment for yes. non? I do have one for a uh, non-agenda. Uh, then uh, this would be, it seems to me, a good time for us to make that phone call. Ruben Perez, you're live at the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Uh, hello everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is uh, Ruben arias Lam Perez, and I'm the current chair of the College of the Desert Board of Trustees. I am humbly calling in as a demonstration of good faith to the Council and the community of Palm Springs. Our board has been working with the city on plans for the Palm Springs campus and have been meeting every other month with council members course and hostage since November. At our January 24th meeting with the council members, I suggested that I come speak to the entire council and I always follow through on my word. Although I was originally scheduled to speak tonight as part of the agenda, our item on the Palm Springs campus was pulled by the city this morning. Giving this significant public interest in this project, I was disappointed to hear that the city council my presentation as a board chair representing the college. Our board president, Dr. Marcia, also planned to participate. However, the city informed us late yesterday that our presentation time had been moved back until after 8 p.m. This morning, Dr. Garcia informed them that she would be, able, be available to be here until 17, 15 p.m., but would have to depart for a long planned college foundation function all of which was not necessary to begin with because I plan on giving the presentation in the first place. Although I am disappointed that I am not able to speak as originally planned as part of the agenda, I thought I'd say a few words during public comment until we are able to schedule a presentation at another meeting soon. So while I'm here, I want to re uh, reiterate the fact that I, that I myself and the board are committed to making this project happen. You have my word. The Palm Springs City Council have been excellent partners on this project dating back to 2010 with the original donation of land. We want to work with you to get this project done. I mean, who really wouldn't want to make this happen? It's such a great concept for students, for the region, and a project that we can all be proud of. And I know that we'll get it done together. The main reason why I wanted to come forward this evening is to reaffirm our project, that our project is going to move forward and being open to uh, being transparent in the process. To that end, our next meeting with your council members will be in March and everyone is invited. Please come. I know we are working with your team to find a new time to come back and meet with the full council. Thank you and I'm looking forward to that. Thank you for your comments. Madam Mayor, that does conclude public comment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mejia. Chairman Perez, thank you for uh, calling in. We very much look forward uh, to scheduling that meeting in March when uh, uh, President Garcia, anyone from the Board of Trustees and uh, members of the public can be present. With that, uh, we are 10 minutes to seven. Mr. Mejia, are we required to wait until 7 p.m. before beginning item 2A? Yes, we do. We have to wait until seven. Okay, then we will take a 10 minute break uh, until 7 p.m., at which time we will uh, reconvene for item 
uh, 2A, and we, that will be followed by item 2B. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, everyone. It is uh, now uh, 7 p.m. and we are 7.01 p.m. and we have met our burden of beginning item 2A after 7 p.m. Uh, so with that, I uh, reconvene the uh, regular Palm Springs City Council meeting. Uh, our next item is 2A, a public hearing regarding redistricting of city council boundaries. Uh, Mr. Marie, I believe you're going to begin the staff report. Very briefly, uh, I really am just here to introduce Jim Priest, the elections expert and our consultant for our redistricting process. And I'll hand it off to Mr. Priest. Mr. Priest, welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, uh, honorable staff, uh, members of the public. It's good to be with you this evening. Jim Priest from Best Best in Krieger. Um, I'm just going to be very brief with the background. Uh, we're here at uh, the third public hearing in the re or redistricting process. Uh, by way of background, every 10 years, cities that elect their officials by district have to look at their latest census data and determine whether those district boundaries have to be adjusted to maintain what we call population balance, meaning as nearly as equal in population, uh, allowing for certain uh, deviations under the law, which we're going to get into in just a second. Um, the city, as part of the redistricting process, did look at its current electoral district maps, which it adopted back in 2018 under the California Voting Rights Act. Uh, the result of that analysis was that the city had a higher deviation than the courts uh, uh, bless. Uh, the courts typically uh, rule that a 10% or smaller deviation, meaning your most heavily populated district and your most lightly populated district, have less than a 10% population spread between them. Uh, in this case, we had a little over 12%. And so under applicable law, that required the city to look at the boundaries and make some adjustments in order to get that deviation back down below 10%. Um, as part of the redistricting process, uh, we are required to have a minimum of four noticed public hearings. As I mentioned earlier, this is the third in that series. Uh, the city has also conducted a number of workshops with the public to solicit input as to how these districts uh, boundaries should be adjusted. Um, and as a result, uh, we have a number of maps that have been submitted, both by staff and by members of the public. Uh, some of those the council has seen before. Uh, for example, uh, map A and map B in the staff report uh, do provide options that do population balance the city and get that deviation below 10%. However, there was a concern expressed at the time that um, that did not result in a majority minority voting district in District 1, and that did not reflect council or community priorities. And so those two map options were considered and um, largely moved on. Uh, at the second public hearing, uh, we considered map option C uh, at some length. And uh, the council uh, noted some good things about it, some possibilities for amendment and uh, other places where we could make some adjustments uh, to reflect communities of interest. And so taking map option C uh, with the council's input, we ended up with map options D and E. Now these were staff generated options that were slated to go to a third public hearing that we were going to have last month. However, before that hearing, uh, we had discussions with staff and the conclusion was that map options D and E, while they population balanced the districts and got that deviation below 10%, uh, there was a lot going on with those maps, a lot of changes, a lot of shifts, uh, some things that may or may not have uh, uh, reflected community priorities. And based on those concerns, uh, staff postponed the third public hearing and map options D and E were not presented at that meeting. Uh, rather, what we did was we asked the staff to go back to the drawing board with map C and see whether they, it could be made simpler 
see whether, uh, you know, just less going on and uh, also respect uh, the input we had received from the council as well as from the public. Um, and what you see in the staff report, and I apologize if this is going a little out of sequence, it's just sort of the nature of how this uh, rolled out. Map option J in the staff report is the recent map produced by our demographer. Uh, and that is the attempt to incorporate not only what we heard from the council with regard to map option C, but also to uh, incorporate a good deal of public comment that we received when we received publicly submitted maps. And the reason I had mentioned uh, some of the maps out of sequence is maps A through E were ones that staff, the demographer generated. Map J is a follow-up one that staff generated. Then we have map options F, G, H, and I, which are reflected in the staff report. Those four were submitted by members of the public. Um, I would particularly note map option F, uh, that came from uh, Mr. David Friedman, and in addition to having the map, came with a considerable amount of comment uh, about neighborhoods, communities of interest in the city. And uh, we as staff found that input very helpful. And map option J, uh, to a certain extent, does incorporate some of these comments in there, as well as other input that we'd received from staff um, you know, prior to this hearing. So. Tonight, we would ask that the focus be on the publicly submitted maps, uh, and the council can, can consider those. And then from a staff perspective, if you're interested in looking at the staff-generated map, we would ask you to look at map option J. That is the most recent one that to date has been our attempt to incorporate the comments that we have learned along the way in all of the previous iterations. And so with that, um, Mr. Mejia, are we able to pull up the Google map tool yes. on the screen? And I'll bring up the map right now. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry, before I go any further, Madam Mayor, were there any questions of the council at this point or would you like me to continue? I think there are a couple of questions. I know I have uh, one or two. Uh, and so let me go ahead and get started. Uh, as I understand it, map option J is the last one that's been uh, uh, put together, and it is one that uh, uh, was driven by staff, but reflective of uh, the information that you receive from members of the public. Uh, as you know, uh, when we went through the redistricting process, uh, in uh, the last time, which was uh, 2018, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. uh, there was a number of criteria that was established by the city. We repeated that criteria again in uh, this year. Uh, does uh, map option J conform to all of the criteria that's been established by uh, the city of Palm Springs, uh, as well as uh, with uh, state and federal law. Yes, it does, Madam Mayor. And it also incorporates uh, the comments that we received from the public, as well as from uh, you and from other staff. Yes. And, and, and Madam Mayor, if I could add, um, this map J is, is the only map that does create a minority majority district of voting age population. So while some of the publicly submitted maps do reach a minority majority uh, district, it is only in total population, uh, not of voting age. And so uh, map J would be the only map that actually conforms to all of the, the criteria set by the city council. Okay. And another question, uh, it just I'm asking you to repeat, uh, uh, Mr. Priest, something that you've already said, but there's a lot of confusion on how you measure deviation. And uh, the, as I'm understanding it, the only thing that matters is what is the difference between the most heavily populated uh, district and the least heavily populated district. And none of the other deviations from the ideal make any difference at all. <laughs> I know, file this under, they said there'd be no math, right? Um, <laughs> um, yes, the way you measure that deviation is basically the highest high and the lowest low. 
And so, ah, thank you, Mr. Mejia. So if you look at District 3, that's your highest high. That's over by 7.59%. Uh, Mr. Priest, right now I'm showing them the, the existing uh, boundaries, the existing maps deviations. Yes. I mean, am I, am I seeing those? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing those. Yeah. Okay. So currently, you have your highest district, the, the population that is the most over perfect equality is District 3. You're about 7.59% over. You have 680 people. If you look at that prior column, that may be easier to do it than just percentages. You have 680 more people than perfect equality in that district when you divide up the total population by five districts. And then your lowest low is District 1, which is under by just slightly over 400 people. So basically in a nutshell, District 3 has too many people, District 1 has too few people, and redistricting rebalances that population so that that deviation is below. The deviation in this case, you basically take the 7.59% and then you add it. I know, you're adding a minus, but that's its statistics. <laughs> And the 4.54, and that gets you to that total deviation, which Mr. Mejia will show on the bottom of that screen, which is the 12.13. So yes, it's the it's the spread between the highest high and the lowest low. And the other districts, for example, like District 4 and 5, are very close to equal. And so they're just statistically in the middle, but they do not determine that deviation. I, I hope that makes sense. It does make sense. Uh, so uh, okay. I've been dominating the questions. Uh, do any of my colleagues have questions? I'm not seeing any questions. Council Member Woods. Thank you. Um, um, Jim, can you, um, the map J um, option, um, and I think you said that um, um, one of our constituents uh, made a comment that you found very helpful to map, map J. Um, can you talk about that? And if we were to incorporate that comment, what that means to deviation and all that, I don't know if you've been able to do that kind of work yet. Yes, yeah, certainly. If, if you'd like, I, I, I was hoping to get into map J in a little bit more detail. Uh, if you'd like, I, I could do that now if there are no just uh, uh, general questions, I can get into the map. Um, but I can tell you some of the comments that have been incorporated into Map J. Um, let's see. Um, this, moving the Sunmore neighborhood out of District 3. Now, this map does a little different than the than uh, what Map F, Mr. Friedman, had suggested. He had suggested moving from District 3 to 2. This moves it from three to one because one uh, is, you know, more under. <laughs> it's weird the way the statistics work. And, uh, you know, District 3 has, has the most population to, to move to another district. Um, uh, Sun, uh, the DAP Health Campus at Sunrise Vista Chino, moving from District 3 to District 2. We're, we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, again, these, these were ideas, they, they weren't always directly incorporated, but they were ideas that were considered uh, as uh, part of map option J. And, um, you know, again, it, 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 there were some comments that were incorporated, some that weren't. I mean, I, I, I can't quite get through all of those right now, but I can take you through the map if, if that would help. Um, Please go ahead and look, uh, describe the map. Oh, sure. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Mejia, if you could overlay the existing with option J so we can see the areas that change there. That's how it is right now. Okay, it is. Great. Um, there, you know, as I indicated earlier, you know, one of the features of map option J is that it is simpler than some of the prior options. There's just a lot less moving. And what things do move in here, many of them are non-substantive. 
Um, you know, we're moving a line just to conform better to the naturally artificial boundary in place there, but it's not moving any people or it's moving just a handful of people. But the areas that significantly move people or areas, one, is, oh, Mr. Mejia has already identified the first one in the Amico Avenue or Amico Street neighborhood. This is an area that would move from District 1 to District 2. And so that's the first one. And, and Mr. Priest, if I could note, I believe this was a comment from uh, Council Member Garner in which she was requesting that um, all of the residents of Gene Autry be into one neighborhood, or I'm sorry, one district. And so if we were to take the Amico Street area and put that into District 2, it would join the other residences of uh, District 2, I'm sorry, of Gene Autry. Although Gene Autry does extend um, more north, uh, those are, are not populated areas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I, I remembered the comment coming from the council. I couldn't remember which council member. So thank you for uh, reminding me and that it was uh, Council Member Garner. Um, if we move to, so there's that one, then we, Oh, okay, you've moved down to Sunmore. Okay, we can do that. Uh, the Sunmore area would be moving from District 3 to District 1. And that moves about, oh, I'm, I'm trying to remember the exact number there. Um, about 125. 130, I believe, around there. Um, so that would move from District 3 to District 1. And then there's a very small part down kind of on the southeast side of Sunmore, if you could zoom in on that. That's um, set right now in this map to trans over to District 4 from District 3. However, uh, staff may have more to say about this, Mr. Mejia, about the idea of moving that area actually to District 1. Uh, right. It would require splitting the census block in that area, but it's a very small split. That whole area contains three houses. We would estimate a population of more, no more than nine or 10, going with average population figures. So moving that to District One, uh, you know, would not you know change the statistics all that much. It would be a very small move. But again, staff staff looked into that issue as well of that place moving to District One instead of to District Four. Correct, and and I'll just note so so staff is acknowledging that this is not a clean line uh, and doesn't incorporate those three residences that are within Sunmore. Uh, when we bring that back, the final map it would be our intention to. Uh, go ahead and split the census block so that uh, those uh, residences below Andreas Road will be in uh, District uh, 5, and all of Sunmore will be in District 1. Right, right. And then, uh, Mr. Mejia, if you could... Uh, District 4. I'm so sorry, yes. Okay, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, and then, Mr. Mejia, if you could zoom up to Sunrise Vista Chino. That is another area that would shift. And I, I can't remember whether, uh, I think this was in part a public comment, and I think this may have also come uh, from, from one of you on the council as well. If you look at there, it basically takes the DAP campus Sunrise Vista area and moves that to District 2. And so it basically cuts off that corner right there at Sunrise Way in East Vista Chino, uh, you know, basically bringing that block all under one district there. Um, so that's another significant change. Um, and then Oh, um, Mr. Mejia, do you want to talk about Lawrence Crossley really quick and what we 
have yes. done to address that. So, so if you see, we have Lawrence Crossley pulled up. We're, we're going to ensure that all of the Lawrence Crossley neighborhood is within District 1, where it was previously split between those homes that are on the exterior side versus the interior side of uh, uh, Lawrence Crossley. We'll ensure that the entire neighborhood is in District 1. And refresh my memory, Mr. Mejia. We, we're going to have to split a census block for that one, but no. are we... No, we are this, not one does not, this one does not require a census blood split. Okay, okay. All right. Um, there is a slight adjustment over by, uh, if you go to the bottom of, where is it? Uh, below, the, below Duluth Park, the boundary of District 1 and 4. You'll see there are some areas that shift there. Uh, and then also, if you go north uh, to the area sticking out there to the east in District 4, uh, yes, that area. Those are just meant to you know, clean up the lines and the blocks a bit. Those are really non-substantive changes. They're not moving anybody. Um, and that's really all. You know, one other change I will mention about this map is if you go, Mr. Mejia, all the way out to the west end by the aerial tramway, I want to note this. It, it doesn't change population much, but it, it is a large piece of territory that would shift under this map. So, yeah, if you could just go out to the very far end um, I'm sorry, uh, zoom out and take me over to the tramway. So there we go. You'll see that very large brown territory there. That would shift under this map from D District 3 to District 5. However, again, that moves a negligible population. I believe the census number is about five people in that entire territory. So again, while it's geographically large, population-wise, it doesn't shift much. And you'll see there's that line just north of the aerial tramway that's just sort of rounded off instead of that squared off corner. Uh, that was just to follow the uh, contour of the tramway road there. Um, so again, geographically significant on the map, but population-wise, it doesn't shift much. And, and Mr. So, Reese, um, I would just note that um, we've received comments that it would be more appropriate for this area, this mountain area, to be part of uh, District 3, since it's really kind of the backyard of District 3. And so uh, unless staff or council objects, uh, it would be staff's intention to go ahead and move uh, this area as part of District 3. Yes, I, I think, I mean, the, the shifting of five population would be negligible in this case. So I think that would be fine. Um, just getting back to the map overall, um, and you'll see in the staff report behind map J, we have demographic analysis available for you. Um, this map, in total gets you down to a 9.6% deviation, which is under 10%, so that's legally compliant. Um, district 3 still is, is your highest populated district with, at 527 people over. District 2 becomes your least populated district at 333 people under. And so, again, you'll see the deviation is at 9.6. Um, as I indicated, uh, you know, shifting that large piece west of District 3 or keeping it in District 3, uh, I don't think is going to shift these numbers to a much higher deviation. Five population won't do it. But I would note any other significant shifts of population into District 3 or out of District 2, because again, they are the two outliers, the two with the biggest spread. Any more people in the District 3 or less people in the District 2 risks pushing that deviation beyond 10%. Um, 
And as Mr. Mejia noted earlier, if you take a look at District 1 and you just start going across the row, you'll see the raw population, the percent deviation population. Uh, total non-white, 64.31%. That's total population. Non-white voting age population at 582 but then if you see that figure that Mr. Mejia pointed out, non-white CVAP, non-white citizen voting age population, 2019 figures, 51.46. This is the only map option that staff has prepared so far that brings that number to that high, brings that number that high. Uh, the other options so far either do something lower than that or they, or they don't achieve beyond uh, you know, 50% non-white CVAP. They may be high, above 50% in just voting age population or total, but not in the citizen voting age population. And as the council knows that, that's really a, a key population because that those are your voters. Um, and so with that, um, that is map option J. Again, uh, I'm prepared to talk about any of the map options if you'd like. Uh, we can talk about the publicly submitted maps as well. And uh, I'm open to any suggestions the council or the public has. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Priest. Thank you, Mr. Mejia. Are there questions for uh, either Mr. Mejia or for Mr. Priest? I'm not seeing any questions. So this is a public uh, hearing. And at this time, I would like to open the public hearing. The public is invited to speak on the public hearing for up to two minutes. Mr. Mejia, do we have any uh, speakers? Uh, Mr. Mejia, I think you're uh, muted. David Friedman, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you, Mr. Mejia. Good evening, Mayor Middleson, Mayor Pro Tem Garner and council members. My name is David Friedman. I am a resident of District 5 and as noted earlier, the submitter of Map F and the methodology I used in creating the map is in your staff report. One of my objectives in drawing district boundaries was to keep the population of each district as close as possible to the ideal of 8,956 residents. And the map I drew has a deviation of 5% or about half the deviation in new map J, noting that there's a slight differential of about 207 residents between the publicly available tool uh, and uh, the census data that um, staff and Mr. Priest have been using. However, I recognize that another important objective is to reduce deviations from the existing council districts that were the product of extensive public comment, including for me. While I continue to offer map F for your, for your review for the reasons noted in the staff report, I would support map J with several adjustments also noted in the staff report that are consistent with the current council boundaries and in fact have just been discussed this evening. First, the three houses on the east side of Airline Drive as it curves north from Andreas Road should be moved from District 4 to District 1 to be with the rest of the Sunmore uh, neighborhood. Second, the area around the DAP Health Campus at Sunrise and Vista Chino in the Rogers Ranch neighborhood should be moved from District 3 to District 2. And finally, as also just noted, the mountain area west of Vista Las Palmas and north of Alejo Road should be moved from District 5 to District 3. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Madam Mayor, that does conclude public comment. All right. So with that, uh, there being no other speakers, the public hearing is now closed. Is there a discussion or additional questions from council? Council member, Gar or excuse me, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Thank you. Um, I thank you so much for those presentations information. Um, I did have a question. Um, so for the Giannatri neighborhood, um, my request was actually that all of Giannatri be in district one. Um, but obviously I'm also sensitive to meeting our other objectives. And so if that's not possible for us to meet our objectives, then, then that's fine. Um, the, the Arnico area though, that was in district one is a largely Latino neighborhood, um, low to moderate income. So it kind of, it fit well within 
district one, but I think there was also comments um, prior to keep the dis keep the neighborhood group whole, which is why I had suggested to just include all of Gina Tree neighborhood um, within district one. So I, I would be interested if it's possible to get the numbers, um, if we were to do that, what that would look like. It's not a huge area, but um, obviously we, we don't have that much wiggle room. Uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, I, I could certainly look into that for the council if you'd like. Uh, one thing I would note that under this map option is District 2 is already your lowest population district at about 330 under, and District 1 is under by about 100. So if you were to move more to District 2, that might require moving more from District 3. And you, you know with the map drawing, sometimes you can get that cascade effect a little bit there. But we can certainly look into that and see whether we can create a population balanced option that keeps all of Gene Autry in District 1. Um, and, and I can note, uh, because I do have the mapping tool open, that the portion of Gene Autry, uh, I'm sorry, The portion of Gina Tree that would need to move over would be 1,600 people. <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> well, that that would be a problem. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for that. I, I appreciate you just giving me the numbers. That's really what I needed to know. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, 1,600 people, I think, puts you in, in and of itself at about a 17 or 18% deviation. So... Um, thank you, Mr. Mejia. Mm -hmm. uh, Council Member Kors. Uh, sure, I just want to note um, that uh, Las Palmas Neighborhood Organization, their line has changed to um, Takwitz, um, west, west of uh, Palm Canyon. I know that adds 79 people, which it can't. Um, I, so, uh, but I did want to note that and make sure before we vote on a final map, uh, you know, we send that to them. Um, 31 are in sort of uh, the downtown project and the rest are, I think must be above businesses because um, I walked I walked it um, and found out at least on the grid properties. But uh, so those are those are new since, you know, people living there, um, some of them, uh, but that would throw the numbers off. So I just wanted to make sure we, the city does the outreach and I'll do the outreach as well before we bring these back since we'll be splitting that neighborhood organization for just a, a small group of people, but they weren't in it until recently. So um, but I just wanna make sure they, they're notified. Are Thank there you. other discussion uh, comments? Uh, I wanna congratulate uh, Mr. Mejia, Mr. Priest, uh, everyone in the public. Uh, we spent a tremendous amount of time and energy uh, uh, three years ago uh, with uh, map making. And I think the benefits of all of the work that we did then uh, has, has clearly paid off. We are able to produce uh, a really efficient map uh, that makes uh, very minimal changes uh, from what we did. Uh, the public has gotten used to these, uh, these maps and uh, uh, anyone else, uh, Unless someone else has a different idea, I believe we should uh, uh, move forward with uh, Map J, given the, the modest changes that uh, Mr. Mejia and staff have presented to us. And Madam Mayor, I'd like to ask for clarification on one issue, which is the DAP um, uh, area. Would you like that to move over to um, join Rogers Ranch in, I believe it's district, I want to make sure. Two. District two. Just a quick question. That's that's where it currently is, right? That is how it is currently done. Yeah. Yes. Okay. No, I mean that's where it is in the districts we're currently in as well. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that should stay, I would think. Let's uh council member Woods has uh some different idea. I believe uh given that district two is uh, our least populated, we should be really reluctant to move anything out of district two. Um, I would agree. Um, Rogers Ranch um, has a um, great relationship with DAP. They work really well together um, so far. So I think that's good. Um, you know, Gene Autry has also expressed that they don't want to be split. They've um, called me several times about that. 
Um, so I think Map J fits um, both of those things. And um, Map J also um, for the Upper West Side seems to fit what they were wanting as well. Uh, Mr. Mejia, given that we need to have four public hearings, uh, do we make uh, a motion and vote to move this map forward? Or do we uh, simply give, give you the direction that we have already given and then this comes back to us uh, with a new map uh, at the fourth hearing uh, and we vote at that time? Correct. I believe we can take your direction. We'll develop a final map for your approval and present it at the next council meeting. All right. Is there any other comment uh, from anyone? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Thank you. Um, I'm just also interested in what it would do to the numbers um, in terms of uh, Hispanic non-white population if if Arnico tracked were kept into District One, I'm just curious what those were. If we can have them for the next meeting as well, sure. We can bring you uh, two two maps for you to be able to review, and you can adopt either one. Thank you. And and I do want to clarify uh, when I looked at the mapping system and I said 1600, it it takes um, uh, that census block includes both the the rest of Gene Autry neighborhood. And Desert Park Estate, uh, not so, um, and Ranch Club Estates. So, really, I would say about half of that. So, about 800 people would shift over. All right. Uh, Council Member Hallstitch. Just for the record, if I can, um, since it's a public hearing, I just want to note that I spoke to the city clerk about um, the maps and asked all, him all my questions about, um, I asked about Smoke Tree, I asked about Talkwitz and Farrell and the districts um, and neighborhoods around that area um, and a few other issues. So I just wanted to note that I asked those questions ahead of the meeting. Great. Uh, Mr. Mejia, you've got the direction uh, you need. Mr. Priest, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good evening, everyone. With that, we will move on to item 2B, consideration of the historic designation of the El Dumpo Adobe, located at 2275 South Araby, and the Araby Rock Houses, located at 2350, 2500, 2501, 2540 and 2550 South Araby Drive. I would like to ask for a staff report. Madam Mayor, members of council, the item that you have before you is a request for designation of six separate structures in the Araby Cove neighborhood. So give me just a moment. I will start sharing my screen for the PowerPoint presentation. And there we are. So these applications were initiated by the city of Palm Springs. This is not the typical way that you see uh, historic designations coming before you, um, but uh, per section 8.05 of the municipal code, the city can initiate designation. These particular structures were identified by the Historic Site Preservation Board as part of their work plan a couple of years ago. Typically, the Historic Site Preservation Board identifies structures that are worthy of designation. And as part of staff's work plan, we then proceed with doing the research on such properties. As this has been initiated by the city, we have notified the property owners of the structures on several occasions. Uh, we first reach out when the items were placed on the Historic Site Preservation Board's work plan. And then again, as these items have come forward for public hearings uh, and visits by the Historic Site Preservation Board. Uh, one of the things to note is that even though the city is conducting these designations, that all of the property owners would be eligible to seek Mills Act tax relief if they are designated as either class one or class two structures. And so we just wanted to make that clear to the property owners that they would be eligible for those tax deductions. 
Let me go through the structures individually and just identify uh, how they meet the criteria for designation. The first structure is an Adobe residence at 2275 South Araby Drive, also known as the El Dumpo Adobe. Um, that, unfortunately, that's a rather uh, unusual name for a structure. Uh, there's debate in terms of how that originated. Uh, we've re requested information from the historic uh, um, organization here in town, and uh, there's a couple of stories in terms of how that might have originated. But in terms of its qualifications for designation, it does meet criterion number three and number four for designation uh, relative to the time period and the method of construction, and also retains sufficient integrity for class one designation, even though it has had a number of additions to it, you can still easily tell the original portion of the structure that was const constructed in 1926. Moving on to the next structure, which is also on uh, Araby Drive, just a little bit down from the Adobe, is the residence at 2350 South Araby. This one was built between 1925 and 1926 and also meets criterion number three and number four for designation and does have sufficient integrity for class one designation. The next four structures are a little bit further uh, down and around the corner on Araby Drive. And these collectively are known as Hopi Village. Uh, were designed and constructed by R. Lee Miller uh, sometime between 1929 and 1933. These particular structures meet criterion number three, number four, and number five. Uh, relative to the method of construction, the time period, uh, the story they tell about the neighborhood, and also for Mr. Miller's participation in the construction of these structures. The structure at 2540 is the best maintained of all of the structures. Two of the structures are uninhabited. Uh, you will note that there is some deterioration However, as stone structures, though, they still retain sufficient integrity for class one designation. And so we just wanted to make that known that despite the fact uh, that they are not inhabited and there is some deterioration, uh, the stone portion of the structure remains intact. And so it still has the character uh, as when originally constructed. The Historic Site Preservation Board in their consideration of these six structures found that all buildings meet the necessary criteria for designation. Uh, they did review the deterioration of some of the Hopi Village buildings, but found that they still merit class one designation. At that hearing, one of the property owners, the owner of 2540 South Araby, objected to the designation at the public hearing. You also have information in your background materials of a packet of information that the property owner has submitted for your review. Uh, she is still requesting that her structure at 2540 South Araby not be included in the designation. Despite that objection, the Historic Site Preservation Board voted to recommend approval of all buildings as class one or landmark structures. And so that is the recommendation that you have before you this evening. With that, Madam Mayor, that concludes my presentation. As the city is the applicant, uh, we are the ones who would respond to any questions. We've made our presentation. Uh, however, any property owners that may wish to speak should be given some additional time in order to uh, identify either their support or objection to these designations. That concludes my comments and thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Are there questions for uh, staff? Council member Kors. Great, thank you. Uh, so for the, um, the one homeowner who has objected, um, I guess two questions. One, um, from my recollection, we have approved historic designations um, when the property owner, including homeowners have objected in the past, correct? That is correct, we have. Okay, and from a legal point of view, um, the criteria are there, does it change anything? Or if the criteria are met, it, it's, it's historic, if it doesn't, it doesn't? 
Yeah, you're correct. Okay. Uh, regardless of whether or not the property owner supports the designation, the, the findings that we must make are, does it comply with the definition and the findings that must be made for historic designation? Uh, and in this case, the structure at 2540 South Araby does meet the criteria. Okay. And just for the public, the clarify, in this case, we're acting sort of in a quasi-judicial role, looking at the facts um, and whether they fit the law. Is that fair to say, or do you prefer the city attorney um, comment on that? I just want to make sure the public understands. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, it's important for you to look at the findings and consider the facts and the merits of the case. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Uh, uh, Flynn, um, in instances where we uh, override the wishes of the homeowner in establishing a property as being uh, historic, uh, what considerations do we make uh, uh, before making that kind of decision? I, I think the most important thing that you need to consider is whether or not it meets the criteria for designation, um, but also you need to take into consideration um, what designation does in terms of telling the story of Palm Springs. In looking at these particular structures, these are all early structures that were constructed in the Araby Cove neighborhood uh, right after the subdivision was approved. And so uh, they very much are a part of that particular neighborhood and do tell that story. Um, but uh, again, there has to be some type of uh, public benefit to the designation where we may override the wishes of a property owner. And from a practical standpoint for the property owner, uh, what does uh, making this a property historic uh, mean in terms of what they can and cannot do with uh, their property going forward? So with historic designation at the local level, any significant modifications to the structure would need to receive approval from the Historic Site Preservation Board. Uh, so there is that additional step in a process if the property owner were to significantly modify or expand the structure. Um, in terms of maintenance, uh, I will commend the property owner. They have done an excellent job in maintaining the structure. It's in excellent condition. And so they're already doing one of the most important things that they can do, uh, which is to maintain it uh, as it was constructed. Uh, and so that's uh, something that the property owner should be commended for. Uh, we'd like to point out the benefits of historic designation as well. And one of the most important things that we can offer is the tax benefits through the Mills Act. Uh, which then becomes available to the property owner, which is really intended to assist them in the continued maintenance of the structure. Uh, and last question I have, uh, for a property or building uh, of this age, whether it was defined as a historic uh, structure or not, uh, would there not be uh, some substantial uh, hurdles to overcome before uh, anyone could make changes to, uh, to that structure. With the recent changes to our historic preservation ordinance back in 2018, uh, we added two additional classes, class three and class four. This particular structure, if not designated, would be a class three structure, which still does have some protections in place uh, requiring either review by the Historic Preservation Officer or the Historic Site Preservation Board if significant modifications are made. So yes, there still would be some hurdles, uh, some review process that would be necessary as a class three structure, um, but uh, not to the degree as a class one or class two. Thank you. Uh, are there other questions from any member of uh, City Council, uh, Council Member Woods. Oh, Flynn, I don't know if you're able. Could you um, pull the picture up of the the um, the, pro the the resident that protested um, the designation? 
And um, is that possible? Oh, great, thank you. You'll give me just a moment, let me back up. So it's the one in the upper left of the photos. It's the, the structure that has the rounded portion. And then uh, did they give a reason why they're protesting? Um, it doesn't look like you can do a whole lot of alteration to it. So I just, unless they wanna do something different with the site. You should have in your packets or received materials uh, with a lot of information in it, uh, there are some issues relative to access and maintenance of adjacent properties that the property owner points out as her objections. Um, but uh, again, it is a well-maintained structure. So, so this um, and um, was it not? Um, did it um, versus the individual structures? We did not create a district. Um, would that have been a different? A process or approach to this and maybe get less protest? Yeah, it would have been a, a different and lengthier process to create a district. One of the issues in attempting to create a district is that while four of the structures are together, two are not. And so you don't have the contiguity that you really need for a historic district. Um, you have to do some rather significant gerrymandering in order to do that. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we didn't consider identifying this as a district. It's just the difficulty in doing so. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Any other questions? Then uh, this at this time, I'd like to open the public hearing. The public is invited to speak on this uh, public hearing item for up to two minutes, although uh, with the... Uh, Homeowner who has objected, uh, we will uh, give great discretion in terms of uh, the time we allow. Uh, and Madam Mayor, I am trying to reach her. It's going straight to voicemail, but give me one second. I'm sorry, Madam Mayor. Um, I am sure it is the correct phone number because it is identified as uh, Ms. Rupp's uh, voicemail. However, it is going straight to voicemail and up. Oh, she's calling me. One second. Welcome to the service in District 4, cell phone reception. <laughs> Very true. Uh, Mr. Mee, I don't want to read the number to you but i, I, I have it madam madam mayor okay uh miss julie rupp you're live at the palm springs city council and you have two minutes to provide your comments thank you hello no one including the city attorney city manager and city council Welcome to the service. Okay, you're live with the council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Okay, hello. I'm concerned because no one, including the city attorney, the city manager, the city council cares about the safety and welfare of myself, my family, my former tenants, my neighbors and friends. My family and I have been discriminated against and denied the peaceful and quiet enjoyment of our home. 
The city of Palm Springs and the actions of the uphill neighbor supported by code enforcement to intentionally damage me and my family. Quiet enjoyment is the right of a property owner to enjoy his or her property without interference. Facts. Due to the inactions of the city of Palm Springs, myself, my family, my tenants, my neighbors and friends have been damaged. Please do the right thing regarding safety and welfare of owner and occupants at 2540 South Araby. I have three simple requests that I have been asking since 2014. I do not want to be designated 2540 South Araby at this time. It doesn't benefit me. You need those other structures because they need to be saved. You do not need to save mine. I am deed restricted and I will become historic when I am ready to become historic. I am not built out like those other two properties who are given a favor in this situation. Two, have the city building and safety call Riverside County Environmental Health to verify working septic systems at both my home and the neighbor home, which is 10 feet away, and my tenant moved out due to the smell. Three, reissue the courtesy notice which is exhibit B for access of city services, trash, police, and fire to not only my residence, to the 17.5 acres of Araby Preserve accessed only through my property. I am unable to rent the historic rock house due to the city inactions about the access road, which is not a dispute between neighbors. It is the only access to 17.5 acres donated to the city of Palm Springs anonymously by my benefactor. She made sure we had to use the levy road because she had problems with levy. The owners before that had problems with levy. And there's an injunction against him doing things to that access road, which the city attorney tells me I got to call the sheriff now. I don't believe that's true. The city of Palm Springs has damaged us. And in addition, in good conscience, I cannot expose a tenant to unsanitary conditions at the neighboring property, 2550 South Araby, occupied full time by the owner. I've been asking the city manager and city council in writing and verbally since 2014 to do the right thing. All I ask for the city is to use their memorandum of understanding to have Riverside County Environmental Health confirm working subject as there is no sewer to the properties 2540, 2550, and the Hopi homes. I again ask the city council to do the right thing and not have 2540 South Araby Historic One designation at this time. I would appreciate you taking the other three properties Madam, and that's clean up. Thank you. Madam Mayor, that does include public comment. Uh, Mr. Mejia, uh, Mr. Ballinger, uh, could you discuss the issues that was raised by, uh, I believe it's Ms. Rupp, with regard to uh, septic systems and the uh, access uh, to the other, prop other properties through her property? Um, I can, Mayor Milton. Uh, I have met with Ms. Rupp on uh, a couple of occasions, including one at the site. Um, and there are two issues that she has. Uh, one is what I would consider a, a private uh, dispute, a civil dispute between her and her neighbor with regard to the access. Um, uh, the second issue is uh, a code complaint that she has lodged with regard to the neighboring property, which uh, I have indicated to Ms. Rupp. Uh, the city code uh, department as well as fire department will be responding to. Um, uh, with regard to uh, the applicability of those two issues uh, to the application that is before you tonight, um, I don't see any particular legal relevance uh, to, to the application with regard to those issues. Um, and as I've indicated, um, certainly the one that the city is involved in, the code enforcement issue, uh, the city is going to be responding. And uh, if, is there septic to these uh, properties? It's my understanding that Ms. Rupp's property does have septic, uh, but um, the, the code complaint with regard to the, the neighboring property is that there is not septic tank and that's what the code uh, is going to go out and inspect for. Certainly. Uh, and if we designate as historic, does that, impact the ability of any of these homeowners to uh, 
install a septic system or to improve existing uh, septic systems? Um, that might be a question uh, better uh, answered by uh, Director Fag, but um, my my impression is that uh, probably would not affect the historical significance of, of the property. Uh, Mr. Fag, uh, I will support what the city has, attorney has indicated that any modifications or uh, improvements made to the septic system would not be impacted by the historic designation. Thank you. Uh, other questions or discussion of uh, Council Member Course? Uh, one question uh, for Director Fag, which is: Is there I mean, most of what we heard had nothing to do um, with whether it met the criteria or not. Uh, it was, um, so um, is there any reason that you see why if we want designated the other house, we wouldn't designate this house looking at the criteria? In terms of just looking at the criteria, no, I don't believe that there is any reason why we wouldn't designate it. Um, however, you as a city council may choose to include structures or exclude structures from the designation uh, based on the testimony you received. Okay, thank you. Uh, council Member Woods. Uh, uh, Flynn, um, on, uh, on the roundhouse is under protest by the applicant. Um, can I don't know how big that lot is, but can they still build out, like if they wanted to build another home or something on that property, is that still available? This doesn't preclude them from doing that. I think I heard her say something like this, is that correct? No, I don't believe that it would preclude based on the size of the parcel in question. Uh, so that's still a possibility, yes. Uh, Council Member Halstitch. Thank you. Um, sorry, can you describe, so I'm concerned about the app, the public testimony we heard uh, from the neighbor. Um, and so I've just, for the record, um, have spoken to her um, at a community meeting um, and then asked staff to follow up with her on those issues that she raised. Um, that was quite uh, many months ago. Um, and then I had Lauren, my legal fellow, reach out to her in advance of this hearing to ask her the status of um, her issues uh, that she raised in the hearing. So um, just for staff, so I understand that it's not um, technically related to this designation, but um, is there any more commitment we can make um, about any of her questions or requests of the city or what would, or could you elaborate for her what her next steps would be since I know she's been um, involved in this for a long time, many, many years. See, I might defer that to the city attorney since he's been actively involved. Uh, the next steps really would be to coordinate uh, an inspection by the code officer, as well as the fire department, um, the, the Potential fire access issue is a, a fire department issue. Um, we've heard from the police uh, personnel that they don't believe it's a fire issue, but um, just to be sure, we're going to send them out there again. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Uh, yeah. None of us uh, take lightly uh, taking and moving forward uh, over the objection of uh, a homeowner. Uh, and, but as I understand it, the issues that she are, is concerned about are ones that uh, are equally addressed irregardless of whether or not uh, there's a historic uh, designation. Uh, and it's very difficult to argue that uh, uh, all of these properties do not uh, fall within uh, uh, what we regularly uh, identify as historic uh, class one structures in our city. So I'm, I'm struggling, uh, notwithstanding uh, the objection of the homeowner uh, as to what criteria we would use uh, other than 
uh, that she does not want us to do so, uh, to, uh, to not move forward with the historic designation. And I hope my freshman English teacher did not hear that sentence because it wasn't structured very well, but uh, hopefully you got the, I got the point across. I will make a motion to approve uh, the uh, uh, recommendation of uh, the staff report for these properties with a notation uh, that it is the desire of city council that uh, assist city staff work with uh, the homeowner in question to resolve uh, uh, any matters that are within the control of the city of Palm Springs. Is there a second? Just, I guess I have a question if I can. Can we do a motion? Do we have to do that separately? Like it's a historic designation motion and then can we include other issues in it? As opposed to just giving general direction on the other issues? It's just a legal question. Obviously I support wanting us to figure out the other issues, but. You're muted, Jeff. Sorry. It wouldn't be a Zoom call, would it? I don't believe there's any legal prohibition uh, with including that type of direction. I think there's some precedent for it uh, with the racket club. There was some there were some related code issues with that. So I don't see a legal problem with it. Certainly not my intent to create. No. <laughs> I, would, I would assume so. So can can that just get repeated so we're all clear on it? Uh, Mr. Mejia, you want to try to interpret my English? Certainly. I have that. It's the desire of the council to work with uh, Ms. Rupp or the property owner on matters that are within our control. All right. Um, that and the designation, I'll, I'll second that. All right. Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Council Member Kors. Yes. Council Member Holstedge. Yes. Council Member Woods. Uh, yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. All right. Thank you. Uh, do you need to read anything on that, uh, Anthony? No. All right. Uh, then we have come to uh, the very last part of our agenda this evening. City Council and City Manager requests an upcoming agenda development. Mayor, short of any requests from council, I'm happy to share my screen and put the tentative meeting schedule up for you to see. All right, please go ahead. Okay. I will note that as of right now, are you seeing the tentative agenda? We are. Okay, thank you. Um, please note a couple of things. One is that we have a study session, um, the first, at least in recent history, uh, February 22nd, where we intend to cover some of the um, remaining work to update strategic priorities, uh, work plans associated with those, and process improvement related work. We have uh, the next couple regular meetings after that identified, February 24th and March 10th. You'll notice those are fairly light agendas. However, we are aware of a handful of things, including the potential rescheduling of the uh, COD presentation and meeting that could potentially be on one of those dates. So I'm not concerned at this point that we won't find um, good work to do during those meetings to, to have kind of our regular length meeting aiming for something around 10 p.m. Um, but if you have items that you think are high priority that you'd like to identify, we can see if there is still space remaining after we add COD and a couple other things that I'm aware we'll, we'll need to place on one of these two agendas. Are there questions or comments from council? Council member Woods. Um, what is the rules of procedures update? I'm, I'm... So the rules of procedure contain a handful of things, including the order of the agenda. And when we presented the first round of strategic priorities and process improvement, I sought direction from council to go ahead and queue some of those things up that we discussed in our visioning sessions, including reordering the agenda. Uh, to create some efficiencies with council meeting flow. So we intend to present those for your consideration. 
Uh, I can't see everyone at this point, so I can't quite tell if there are any other questions. There we go. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Mayor? Yes. If it's okay, if there are no other comments, I do want to take advantage since we do have a future agenda opportunity to discuss the College of the Desert. I want to revisit it for just a moment to make sure that there isn't confusion among the public or council uh, media or otherwise. Um, I think we all appreciate that there is um, an extended commitment to have the conversation and appreciate that uh, Chair, the COD trustees, uh, Ruben Perez, came to tell us that, you know, about that renewed commitment. Although I did pick up uh, perhaps a hint of frustration or friction that we uh, rescheduled the meeting. So I just want to emphasize to, to all concerned that we really did try to coordinate this closely. Um, I think we were under the impression that there would be a meeting as far back as January 24th. I do think there may have been some differences in understanding and how that would happen. Um, you know, we conduct our agencies uh, slightly differently. Um, I know that we certainly focus heavily on engagement and transparency. We promote our meetings and stakeholder groups. So we really made sure that we had the details of this meeting down. We did know that it was the chair who intended to present, but we also had a commitment from Dr. Garcia to answer questions. Um, and we put that information out in a press release as well as all of the other stakeholder group meetings where we promote our agenda topics to generate interest and engage our public. So I did have a couple of exchanges where we were concerned a little bit about the time, but in those emails, as you can see, if you wanna see them, um, we really made a concerted effort to reorder the agenda to place something that was at the very back, at the very front. And, and frankly, even without the issue of our public hearing that was scheduled at 7 p.m., it became apparent with the volume of public comment that, that had we gone right into public comment at the outset of the meeting with 30 or more people wanting to speak at two minutes, plus the transition between calls, it would have been an hour or an hour and 15 minutes before we got to a presentation. So if we call that at 540, and we go to 6.40, we present for 20 minutes, there would have been 15 minutes for questions and answers. So it wasn't, it wasn't meant to dismiss that the chair was uh, here to present, but it was to emphasize that we thought it was important to have robust question and answer to have a full discussion. And so we didn't make the decision unilaterally. Um, I sent an email in the morning, placed a total of five calls today to the College of the Desert Executive Office to make sure that they had an opportunity to respond to what I described as a proposal to postpone the meeting. We wrote a press release and refrained from issuing it until 5.30 this evening because I didn't wanna make that call unilaterally. We wanted to make it in conjunction with our partners at the College of the Desert. I'm sorry that we weren't able to reach them and, and given busy schedules, um, we weren't able to coordinate more closely, but it was not an attempt to um, you know, do something tricky um, we want to have this conversation. It's not trivial that we have everybody present. We've heard over the course of the last number of meetings, sometimes consistent, sometimes conflicting information on who's making key decisions. As one quick example, with the Roadrunner um, Motors, um, I, I was told at one point it might have been board input, but then later I think we heard that it was strictly uh, the superintendent and president's decision. So I thought it was really important that we had everybody here to answer questions and make sure it was a thorough conversation. So again, I apologize if there was some friction there um, in doing what, what we thought was best to have a complete conversation, but wanted to note as we reschedule it, that that was really the only reason um, that we took that tactic. We tried to coordinate. Um, it's difficult with our schedules at the last minute. Uh, we only learned of the conflict for Dr. Garcia yesterday at, uh, after 4 p.m., did our best to respond. Um, the, the, the main point, of course, is that we all look forward to having that conversation as soon as we possibly can, where everybody can attend for sufficient time to make sure that we get all those questions asked and all of those questions answered. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Clifton. And I will repeat again, uh, we as a city council and are extremely anxious to be able to engage with our colleagues on the board of trustees and uh, to engage with President Garcia. Uh, the uh, College of the Desert campus uh, in Palm Springs is one that uh, we have been anxious uh, to see built for a very long time. Uh, we believe it is going to serve 
uh, students across our region uh, and something that uh, we uh, greatly appreciate uh, the reassurance that we received uh, from Chairman Perez that they are committed uh, to the to this campus, but uh, there have been a number of questions and raised and the best way to resolve those questions is for uh, us to get together with uh, sufficient time uh, for everyone to fully engage and for most importantly, the public to fully engage. Uh, with that, if I don't see any other hands go up, uh, at 8.20 p.m., I'm going to uh, adjourn uh, the city council meeting. The next regular city council meeting is February 24th, 2022 at 5.30. But as again noted by uh, the city manager, we have a study session uh, planned for February 22nd. That's a Tuesday evening and... Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, we are beginning that meeting at 5.30 p.m. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.